can see here we've got the David Walter movement that I'm working on at the moment, sorting out the uh, couple of issues with the calendar system here, which is the George Daniels perpetual calendar system. One of the things that would be lovely to do when working on uh, old clocks and watches is to be able to speak to the maker of the of the item and get their take on the uh, on the work that you're doing and be able to talk through any issues you've got with the clock and uh, see what their take on the repair methods they'd like using um, is. It, with this being a modern clock, uh, I've got that luxury of being able to uh, give David a call. So that's what we're going to do now. Give uh, um, David was incredibly generous with his time. Uh, this interview is actually only 20 minutes of a three hour long conversation and uh, I, I'm, I'm great, greatly indebted to him for giving me that, that time to, uh, to talk through uh, the, uh, the clock with him and um, he imparted lots of advice to me uh, with, a, with a view to my, my career making clocks like this myself as well. So. Uh, um, thank you very much, David, for, for giving me the time and the advice. Okay, I'll uh, leave you with the uh, with the twenty minute uh, snippet of recording. Thanks for watching. Talking about the uh, the calendar system that we've been chatting about the um, on your um, on your regulator that I'm working on. Uh, how did you first come to use the system? How did you get to know about the system, and what particularly attracted you to it? I was building or designing a regulator at the time and I wanted a perpetual calendar system, but I didn't like the existing calendar systems that I'd found. And just about the same time, there was an article in the Horological Journal, which I believe was for George Daniel's 75th birthday. And in there was a drawing, a pattern drawing of his calendar for his pocket watch which I, I'd seen photographs of the watch, but I hadn't seen the drawing before. And as soon as I saw it, that's what I wanted. I saw it was good. So um, I actually wrote to the patent office in England, wherever they are, Swansea or somewhere, and, and paid for a copy of the patent, which I got out and then went from there. But I wanted that. That's how I came across it. I thought this is exactly what I'm looking for. Something yeah. new, something different. And I liked the way it worked. Yeah. Was George uh, Daniel's patent, did he do his own drawing for it out of interest? Was it? Uh... I believe he did, yes. Yeah. It, George was very skilled in many ways. He taught himself all, kind, all manner of disciplines. And I believe uh, he, he did the patent drawing himself. Whether he did the, the text for it or not, I'm not sure, because the text in patent drawings is specific language. Mm. And that's where, like, pat, uh, pat, patent attorneys come into into their owners it has to be described unambiguously and it's not yeah. very easy to do that yeah so i have heard people just digressing slightly say that patents are not necessarily the best way forward because it, to take a patent out it's not just the patent itself you've got to be able to afford to enforce it if somebody decides they're going to try and use it you've got to go down the legal route and it's uh, not always enforceable so no, I mean, depends on how big a project the thing is. I have two patent attorney friends, uh, things, but if, if it's like a, a huge a patent with a huge market, you know, then it's no problem. There's, there's lots of millionaires have made money out of patents. They mm. had the clever idea and went ahead with it. So in those cases, you enforce it. Mm. Um, yeah. But it's still big money. Yeah, yeah. Having listened to um, a couple of the interviews that you've given, um, the lectures that you've given, um, I was interested to hear that, the number of clocks that you've built. And um, I was just wondering, um, given the complexity of the one that I'm working on and you know, several of the others that you've worked on, uh, how you've managed to fit it all in, because uh, it's quite a prolific output. Yes, I mean, that clock you're working on now is the most complicated I've made. Yeah. Um, it's also the most complicated double pendulum clock ever made. Yeah. Uh, within, I approach things, once I've decided to do something, I have the goal, the end goal in sight. And I tend to not get distracted by going off side avenues of, of things that are out of it. And somebody, a client will ask me for something or another, and I can think about it and almost within a few minutes, I will know whether that's practical or not. 
The, mm. the mechanical details are something else. They need to be drawn out and calculated. Mm. But generally, like, well, yeah, okay, we can do that. Mm. And I have a fair idea of how long it might take me as well. But also when it comes down to it, it's just as like Daniels would say, it requires long hours at the bench. Mm. Yeah. Now, some days are more productive than others. And on days when things are going good, I keep going. And I either set a deadline like 10 o'clock at night or until I get this done, whichever comes first. Mm. And then call it quits while I'm ahead. Mm. And yeah. then on days where it's not working, put it down, go do something else. Yeah. And come back with a fresh mind tomorrow. Yeah. But really, when I start off doing something, I'm committed to it. And I've known a number of people have tried to do things, but they've got sidetracked here and there and they end up doing something else. And five years later, it's still in the I'll get to it department, mm. which I don't like. So it's, you know, if you're going to start doing something, the way to finish it is to be fully committed at the point of start. Yeah, I good. also would like to say and there is despite current, well, maybe current's not right, popular belief is you do not need a vast amount of equipment. And no. I'm reminded of this in the past, 100, 200 years ago, Breguet, Frodsham, Berthold, Tompion, did not have vast amounts of equipment. They had a certain amount of specialised equipment and great skills. And I, I've come across people say, oh, I need a machine to do this, I need a machine to do that. And I said, no, you don't. And mm -hmm. people have come into here and they said, is this all you've got? You haven't got enough equipment to make this. And I said, well, clearly that's wrong because I've just made it. Yeah. Uh, so versatility in your own mind. Um, there is today I see an, uh, uh, an over-reliance on CNC. Yeah. Which is actually... I, I don't have a CNC machine. No, I neither don't. do I. Uh, I don't have any CNC um, capability. I don't even have a 3D printer or anything. Um, I have been thinking about a CNC router for making templates for my pantograph, but that's as um, as far as I've got towards it at the moment. I, 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 with, with the CNC argument, I do. I think it has its place. I mean, I, I think Tompion had however many apprentices got in trouble for having too many apprentices. Uh, that's his CNC machine in a way. He yes. had apprentices cutting out parts. He would have had, you know, a row of Haas CNC machines cutting out parts in the same way, I'm sure. Exactly. I think also in the world of one offs, a CNC machine is not necessary, it can be made. But the trade off there is you actually have to have machining skills. Mm. And that's generally not being taught because clearly CNC is the way of the future. Mm. Um, and CNC machines are now cheaper than ever, but you still, it's not something you can just sit down and program immediately because you, oh, no. they, there's five years worth of training just to learn how to operate the thing. People have this idea that you can, with CNC, you can just hit the green button and a watch emerges out of the CNC machine. Um, they, they, they don't quite have the full understanding of what's, what's involved. I mean, it's a, it's a tool at the end of the day, but it's, uh, there's a, there's a you poem, don't know how to use it. There's a sort of a poem about that where somebody who was studying uh, CNC machining, I said, this machine doesn't understand what I want. It only does, it doesn't do what I want, it does what I tell it. Yes. That's a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is a good oh, one. And I thought I, I get that because there's the problem of when you hit the button that says create program or go, rarely, as I understand it, does what you want come out first time. Yeah, uh, that, that leads me on to, because um, obviously with CNC, there would be a, a CAD, um, a strong CAD element. You've got to get everything into the computer yes. first. Um, I think, can I just see the corner of a drawing board? Yes. Um, so I was going to ask you, is your design process, um, are, are you on CAD or are you uh, paper and, and paper. pencil? I tried, actually I have to admit, if I was younger, I'd actually be on top of CAD drawing because it's invaluable. Yeah. But I actually tried some time ago to, to work on a CAD system. By the time I got it turned on and made the first line mm -hmm. as a novice, I could have done the whole drawing by hand. Yeah. So I yeah. decided I surrendered and I just stay with pencil and paper. And with your um, 
sort of digging into your design process here a little bit, where, when you're making a clock, how much of a design do you put down first? Do you commit first before you actually start making it? I mean, I would have had an idea in mind of what I want. The first thing I draw is the dial. Right. Or dials on the double pen. Yeah. And from that, that will tell me from the dial, well, now I have my outer parameters, what the movements have to do. Yeah. So once I've actually got my dial positions, your, your cardinal positions is your center hand for the yeah. hour and minutes, and where the seconds hand is, the barrel winding could be wherever you want, and any other functions like calendar all have to be located. Mm. Once you've got the dial drawn, now I can make the movement to match. Mm. Uh, and so uh, I never make the movement first in a dial to suit later on. The dial yeah. comes first. Yeah. Um, Daniels did the same thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I may have, I might sometimes on a bit of paper like sketch out I think, you know, a, a rough drawing of what I might think. Of. Okay, I've got the picture. Now we'll get to the dial. I'll draw that correctly. I have my center points correctly. Uh, how, what diameter or size the dial is, how big a... I had an idea how big the case is going to be. I don't want it to be, you know, oversized. What what can I fit in where and go mm. on from there? Yeah. And do you, um, like for the movement design aspect, I know um, a sort of more traditional clock making approach is the sort of, uh, to make it by feel almost. It kind of evolves as you're making it. But I'm just wondering what your process is as to, um, how, say for example, you've made the train and um, plant the train, would, the, would that have been um, planted, like you wouldn't put any design thought into where the, the wheels go? Oh, no, 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 that's, that's, all, that's all preordained at the beginning. Pre, you do actually sit down and sit and yeah, say to I'll yourself... Do the, I'll do the front you know, plan drawing of it and then yeah. I'll do a, an elevation drawing of it, of where I want you know, barrel, other wheels to be for yeah. whatever reason, you know. Um, I suppose I'm just wondering how organic your process is. Um, no, that, that part, the same as my pillar shapes, uh, the rest yeah. of the pieces I do, that's already drawn up beforehand. Right. And so I know where all that's going to go, I know where the wheels are going to be. Yeah. And the wheels are going to be like on side elevation uh, relative to each other and yeah. to the clock. Yeah, yeah. And that also, the reason for that is because not only do you have like the clock, the size of the door you're going to look for, it's maximum size you can make the dial, but also how deep it's going to be. Yeah. So that, so that determines the next thing, as long as I have a space for the pendulum and then yeah. space enough for the movement and then space enough for the bezel and hands so that, so that it doesn't touch the door, so that it's close to the inside of the glass, but doesn't touch it. Yes. A millimetre yeah. is enough clearance. An yeah. inch is too much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, as a clockmaker myself, with a great fondness for the work of Jean Bier, Breguet, and Berthoud, I'm naturally drawn to some of the clocks that, uh, that, uh, that you've made. What advice do you have for me as a budding clockmaker um, embarking on that style of work? You can hardly do better, uh, choice wise. Uh, Jean Vier is, to me, completely un under respected. Yeah, uh, I agree. He and Breguet were good friends, and I think Breguet bailed him out a couple of times in his troubles. And I think Breguet, uh, Jean Vier designed Breguet's double pendulum clocks, although somebody mm. else made them. But Jean Vier was in incredible in his diversity of designs and, and what he was able to do. Uh, mm. And certainly the dials are something else. They, they've been described as works of art in their own rights. Mm. And possibly Jean Vier's dials are probably the best ever produced mm. uh, in enamel works. Some of his uh, astronomical functions on the dials are, yes, are absolutely absolute, amazing. It's truly amazing what he worked out. So uh, it's, it's hard It's hard to, well, you couldn't possibly beat Jean Vier. And Breguet mm. had very good design aesthetic. Uh, Berthoud was slightly different. He was a bit more monumental. Mm. Uh, and I, I would say better on mechanics than design. Mm. You know, although, I mean, there's, that's not to put it down, but I would suggest find something you would like and start on it. Mm. And when 
when I first got my book, The Heart of Brick A by Daniels, I think mm -hmm. I got it 1978 or 79. And I looked at the first things I saw, I saw the double pendulum clock, the three wheel clock, and the uh, uh, table tourbillon. And I thought, I want to make those. I decided I needed to make those. And it wasn't until many years later I actually had opportunity to get in and to do it. The most difficult of all three has been the table tourbillon. Mm. And it's, it's, although it's smaller. Um, and that's because of scale, also, is it? Yes. Um, yeah. But as those three things I decided out of all the things I wanted to do, somebody once suggested what I like to show, I should make a sympathique. And I thought, oh, I, no, I just, it just didn't sing to me as much as the other pieces do. Mm. Uh, plus, there's a monumental amount of work in a sympathique, you know, um, because it's a clock and a watch. Mm. Right? So I never kind of went, went down that path. Maybe if I was asked, I might. I haven't thought much further about it. But I'd suggest you find something you like that you want to make yeah. and tackle it. Yeah. And if you think it through, you won't, you won't bite off more than you can chew. Mm. And there's always a point of getting disheartened and not be disheartened by, by hitting a wall because there's some bit of technical information you can't find and have to figure out yourself. Mm. And as I said before, if it's been made once, there's a finite number of ways things can... If it, an item is to do a job, there's a finite number of ways that piece can be made. It's not mm. so. Mm. All you have to do is figure out how. Yeah. And while it may be different to the original, as long as the function is okay, how you yeah. got there is even better. Yeah, yeah. And I've always enjoyed that um, aspect of looking at a component and thinking, how am I going to make this? Uh, how am I going to hold it? What machine am I going to use? And I know you were you were mentioning about um, you don't need that many as many tools as people might imagine to do this work. And I do have a relatively luxurious setup that sometimes I'll, I'll look at a part that I've got to make and I'll think, well, I could actually do this on three different machines in different ways and come out with the same result. But sometimes, you know, you, you, you have your, your, your favorite setups that you, you come up with for doing, you know, various, um, various tasks. But uh, Yes. Um, and yeah. al always remember that was what it was done in the past to brick a Jeanville we're talking 240 years ago they never even had electricity mm. what they did have was great skill and more time than what we mm. do but yeah. their materials were horribly expensive compared to ours so yeah. the trade-off but if they could do it with simple machinery and equipment it can't be that difficult yeah and it's certainly yeah. not yeah. impossible it's just up to you to find a way yeah, yeah. and it's there yeah. yeah, yeah, think yeah. out. Think outside, outside the box, or don't even let the box come near you. It's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've certainly been, um, whilst doing restoration work, I've been stocking up ideas uh, about sort of you know technical details that I've seen inside a clock, and um, it, you know different things like maintaining power. You know, different. I mean, there are so many ways of of you know, mounting a wheel, for example, or just any, you know, there, there are so many different uh, options that people have used over the years. And I, I've sort of come up with, you know, sort of a set of things that I, I've, I've enjoyed seeing in restoration work. So that's, uh, that's, that's one of the huge benefits of restoration work and, and seeing all those ideas. Yeah. And, yeah. and sort of picking the ones that you fancy and mm, yeah. using someday yeah sometimes yeah. even finishing touches on little shapes on things make a difference yeah you know, definitely. something that looks good definitely yeah exactly yeah yeah finally the um uh, the the pendulums on this clock um are i believe quartz glass and i notice you use that on quite a few of your clocks and i was wondering what the decision process was on on coming up with that as a material as to um, is it particularly stable in its characteristics and is it any better or worse than, say, Invar as a... The, the stuff is fused silica, which is pure quartz. Pure quartz, yeah. It, uh, you know, and so it's man-made in, in 
somehow. It, yeah. And it's the, it's the most thermally stable material on the planet today. Right. It's, it's better than Invar, not by a huge amount, just slightly better than Invar. Mm. Uh, but it's still thermally stable. The fittings in the top and bottom are all Invar. Mm. And I found when I was first experimenting with the things that I used, like brass rating nuts and things, um, and the, a brass rating nut that was, say, five millimeters thick would give me a temperature error of about four parts per million per degree C. Mm. Right. So I it would grow in dimension. Or, it, or it would grow in dimensions. Yeah. So um, I changed that out. So that, that's why everything, including the pointers, are all Invar. Invar, yeah. But um, the downside is it is that it is a glass and it's fragile, but yeah. treated properly, it's remarkably strong and, uh, and resi uh, you know, uh, resistant to damage. But yeah. I mean, any pendulum shouldn't be whipped around and banged against the wall. It'll yeah. bend or damage, but the, the few silica will break. Yeah. But as straight torsion strengths go, it's way has enough strength that a sheer strength is way ahead and past what the pendulum bobs are in terms yeah. of. Yeah, uh, it's just, uh, just um, a gridiron can be um, uh, bent so that it doesn't work so properly just by picking I've, I've it up wrong. Yes, um, because these things inherently have, you know, big um, massive bob. Um, so yeah, and if they get picked up by the end, the gridiron turns into a banana. Yes, and, and then it doesn't, it doesn't work. And it doesn't slide anymore, and it's not doing no. any compensation. Yeah, no. it, it, exactly. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, and the, the the stuff is easy enough. You, I did try drilling it. It's virtually impossible to drill. I dare say, if NASA wanted to, it could be done. Mm. Uh, but to use diamond drills on water. If it's big enough, I, it can be done, but on a relatively small size, I'm using not. Plus, actually, it's not rod, it's tube. Tube is much stronger than solid rod, because mm. it has two walls, not one. Mm. Um, it, but it can be cut quite easy, but to grind the ends, you need diamond wheels. Mm. Um, and as long as you treat it carefully, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Um... I was just interested by because you seem to have um, taken it on board as a sort of a it's one of your parts of a clock, if you like, that you expect yeah. to see as the um, the quartz pendulum rod. rod. So um, I was interested how you um, had arrived at it. Uh, well, thank you very much for answering my uh, my questions. So um, I've greatly enjoyed uh, our chat, and um, uh, hopefully we'll stay in touch and um, speak to you again in the future. Will do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.